Welcome to the exam two review session. So you will be having an exam in week six coming up here. So this exam is going to cover both weeks four and five material. So I am going to go through the PowerPoint that I have sent out in the email so that we can just kind of do a nice broad overview of what to kind of expect for the exam and the things that might be on there. Again, as always, be sure to go back to the original lecture PowerPoint. You can re-listen to those lecture recordings, um, do your lab review questions, you know, re-look at those. Those are always great questions as well, or any other study guides kind of things from the week, and you should be good to go. For the exam itself, this exam will be 51 points. All 51 points are multiple choice questions, so maybe that makes you breathe a bit easier. There are no pictures on this one. So no pictures, all multiple choice questions, just to kind of give you some background. All right, so with that being said, we're going to bring up the PowerPoint here. All right, there it is. So let me just get this going. Okay, so we'll start back with Chapter 10. That was the very first chapter that we had in Week 4. So Chapter 10 centered entirely around hemoglobin synthesis. So again, hemoglobin is made up of four heme groups, four globin chains. For with the heme groups, those heme groups are being made in the mitochondria of the cell. Each heme group can carry one oxygen. So again, if each heme group carries one oxygen and you have four of them, then the entire hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen. So make sure that you're just really careful on those terms. One heme group, one oxygen. An entire hemoglobin, four oxygen. Inside each of those heme groups is a protoporphyrin ring. Remember that ring is made up of carbon, nitrogen, and hydrogen, I believe. Now I'm like, I kind of had like a brain loss there for a second. And inside that protoporphyrin ring is iron. And again, it's really essential that that iron be in the two plus state. We would call that ferrous. So we need iron to be in the two plus ferrous state in order to properly bind with the oxygen and deliver it. So that is kind of the essentials of the heme for the globin chains. Globin chains are made in the ribosomes and they are actually amino acid sequences put together. So again, ribosomes help make your proteins. Proteins are made from amino acid sequences, so it's natural it should be taking place there. You're going to have different hemoglobins in Every person, adults, are going to have hemoglobin A, A2, and F, whereas babies, when they're first born, primarily just have F, and they might have a little bit of other, but it, it will vary depending on the age. But again, once they kind of hit a certain age in childhood and on, they have A, A2, and F. They're always going to consist of two alpha chains, and then the other chains that they have will make them decide which hemoglobin is which. So in the case of hemoglobin A, that is made up of two alpha and two beta chains. And remember, we have the majority of our hemoglobin is hemoglobin A, like at least 95% of our hemoglobin is hemoglobin A. Hemoglobin A2, those are two alpha, two delta, um, and we have about two to three percent hemoglobin A2, and then hemoglobin F is two alpha, two gamma. And then we have around less than 2% hemoglobin F in our body. So heme and mitochondrial globin get made in ribosomes. They will come out and then they will join up together in the cytoplasm of the red cell. One other thing that came up in Chapter 10 was uh, something that was really important with this whole role of oxygen delivery, and that was 2,3-bis-phosphoglycerate, or we can just say 2,3-BPG. Sometimes you might see it wrote as 2,3-DPG. Same kind of deal, but basically the entire role of it is to help oxygen get released from the hemoglobin molecule. So as we sense our tissues need more oxygen, we will increase this substance in our body to help make sure that it helps that oxygen get off the molecule and get to those tissues. So of course, anytime we have anemia states happening where we're low in oxygen, this is something your body will increase in response to that. All right, other things in Chapter 10, we learned there are abnormal types of hemoglobin. Here are three. So met hemoglobin is when your iron changes to be in that ferric three-plus state. And again, as a result, it's not going to deliver that oxygen the way it should. 
Carboxyhemoglobin is when you have carbon monoxide poisoning. As they discussed in the original lecture PowerPoint, if your hemoglobin molecule has a choice between carbon monoxide and oxygen, it will always pick the carbon monoxide. So it will never pick up oxygen, which results in your tissues not getting oxygen. The blood in the carboxyhemoglobin case is a really classic cherry red color. For salt hemoglobin, this is hemoglobin that has been altered due to various chemicals or drugs that that blood has been exposed to. So those are three abnormal hemoglobins. Now, if you were to see the terms oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin, those are normal. Oxyhemoglobin is referring to hemoglobin that fills up with oxygen. Deoxyhemoglobin is referring to oxygen that has been delivered. There, it has no oxygen on it currently. It delivered it. So those are normal processes in our body to have hemoglobin filled up with oxygen and then to have hemoglobin with none because it delivered it. These are the three that are abnormal on this slide, so I wanted to make sure that was very crystal clear. All right, and then there's a classic measurement in which to measure hemoglobin through you know, in the analyzer with different reagents. And again, those steps were given in a PowerPoint. They were also given in an announcement in the class. And now they're given here again. So I think you get the idea that you're going to have to know this. So first up, we would combine that patient's blood with a lysing agent, and that will lyse the red cells, let free that hemoglobin out of the red cells, because if we need to measure the hemoglobin, we need it to get out of there first. Then we will combine that hemoglobin with potassium ferrocyanide. That is purposefully going to change the iron from a 2 plus to a 3 plus state, creating met hemoglobin. Once that met hemoglobin is created, then they will combine it with potassium cyanide, which will make a color formation. So it'll now be cyan met hemoglobin. It's kind of like a blue color transformation. And that we can measure with a spectrophotometer to get a hemoglobin result or concentration, whatever you want to say. So, jumping into chapter 11, this was more in regards to the iron that's inside of the hemoglobin. Majority of our iron in our body is attached to our hemoglobin in our red cells. Uh, you have so many red cells floating around all the time in your blood, and every single one of them are filled up with iron in there. So, that is where the majority of your iron is actually found in your body. But we do have stored iron as well. Anytime we don't have a need for iron, we put it away. So, we can store it as the protein ferritin in the liver mainly, or there is a degraded form of ferritin called hemosiderin that can also help store the iron. So either one of those are stored iron forms. Anytime that we suspect somebody might be low in iron, which causes an anemia, um, what the most common anemia out there is iron deficiency anemia. And we're going to actually finally get into that next week, I believe, So or this upcoming week, however you look at it, <laughs> so week six. Um, you can measure their serum iron, so iron in their blood, their iron binding capacity, their percent saturation, and then their ferritin stored iron levels. And that would give you an overall picture of someone's iron health, you know, how good of amount do they have or are they weak in it. By the way, before I jump out of that chapter, there is um, that percent saturation. I do ask that you know that calculation, so that's why it's rewrote there for you. All right, chapter 12 was really diving into all of our white blood cell lines and learning them from start to bottom. So unfortunately, you just kind of have to memorize them. So overall function again, your white blood cell is defense, big roles in the immune system. So when you go to immunology, you know, the first couple chapters in immunology discusses the roles that the white blood cells play with our immune system. Neutrophil was our first one that we discussed in that chapter, and here is a neutrophil line. I know I did not include the whole stem cell to myeloid stem cell to see if you gem deal, but we did cover that back in the lecture PowerPoint, so go back and take a look at that if you want to. But here is the essential cell that we can see in the microscope. Myeloblast, promyelocyte, myelocyte, metamyelocyte, band, and then finally your mature segmented neutrophil is the order. So. Function of a neutrophil itself, phagocytosis. So it's a huge phagocytosis to fight bacteria especially. So anytime someone has a bacterial infection, their neutrophil count will be elevated. That's one quick sign of a bacterial infection is to look at their cell counts. If the neutrophil count is elevated, 
it's more bacterial based for their infection and not viral. So in this cell line, the last stage capable of cell mitosis would be the myelocyte stage. And again, neutrophil is a granulocyte that so has several types of granules happening here. We have primary granules that start getting made right away in the myeloblast stage, and then we have secondary granules that will get, begin being made in the myelocyte stage. Again, if you want more information on these stages, go back to the lecture PowerPoint for that. Eosinophil, another granulocyte known for its really bright red-orange granules. We see this increase in allergies and parasitic infections. There was also those charcoal-laden crystals. Um, so they have charcoal-laden kind of protein found in their granules. And when you sometimes look at a smear, you might see these crystals or these granules laying out, out as if they were neosinophil at one point in time, but not so much anymore. So we discussed that in the chapter PowerPoint. Basophil, very few basophils, unfortunately. We have like less than 2% in our body in the bloodstream. But when you do get to see one, they should be identified by their very large purple granules that kind of just take over the whole cell. They cover the nucleus. It's really sometimes hard to see that nucleus. Inside those granules are heparin and histamine, both of which play a big role in allergies. So they also are seen heavily with allergic reactions. Monocyte. Monocyte is the largest white blood cell in size in the blood. Very difficult to identify for students in the beginning because it varies so much in its morphology. But again, the classic signs of a monocyte are like a lighter blue-gray cytoplasm, and quite a bit of cytoplasm, I should say. Um, the nucleus is typically indented at least once, and then the chromatin inside that nucleus is really stringy or lacy looking. So those are kind of the classic um, characteristics of that monocyte. And again, monocytes can go into the tissues, transform into a macrophage, so they all play roles with phagocytosis. Lymphocytes, two types of lymphocytes. We have B and T cells. So they huge, huge, huge roles in the immune system, especially in your selective immune system process. So out of these, the B cells and then B cells can differentiate into plasma cells. Those are the two that can actually make antibodies. And of course, antibodies are key in fighting off diseases. So B cells and plasma cells are the two that will make antibodies. T cells do a little bit of a different role with what we call cell-mediated immunity, and you would worry more about that in immunology class. So as far as the classic look of a lymphocyte, you cannot tell a B from a T under the microscope. They look similar, but they're basically going to have a nice round nucleus. That nucleus takes up almost the entire cell, so very little cytoplasm typically. And again, the way that they're named, B cells mature in the bone marrow, T cells will mature in the thymus. Now, there are what we call reactive lymphocytes that are responding to antigen stimulation. We know they're reactive when you start to see that cytoplasm start wrapping around the surrounding red blood cells. The, the reactive lymph can look similar to monos, but again, that cytoplasm surrounding the red cells is usually key for reactive. Chapter 13 was about platelets, so your platelets we've learned come from the cytoplasm of megakaryocytes. Megakaryocytes are found in the bone marrow. They're the biggest cell in our bone marrow. And when your platelets chunk off and go to the blood, they live for about 10 days. I don't know if we said that in that PowerPoint, but they live for 10 days. Again, in order to make these platelets, you have to have growth factor. The most important growth factor for a platelet line is thrombopoietin. So that hormone will actually come from the liver and go and help make sure that those platelets get created. Your spleen plays a big role in platelets in that it helps store a third of them. So if you were to get rid of your spleen, whether you surgically removed it or it just doesn't function and doesn't do anything, those third of platelets are going to all of a sudden float freely in the blood, increasing your platelet count. Whereas the opposite would be true. If your spleen is overly functioning, doing too much, or it's like super enlarged, then it's going to store more than it should, and then it would decrease your platelet count in the blood. Inside the platelets are granules. There's no nucleus, just granules. We have alpha granules and dense granules, and I did ask that you remember what's contained in each. In the alpha granules, we have some growth factors. We have some coagulation factors, 5, 8, and fibrinogen. If you are missing your alpha granules, it is what we call gray platelet syndrome. 
Inside the dense granules, this one's a little easier. Just we needed you to remember serotonin, ADP, and calcium. And again, if you're missing your dense granules, it's called the storage pool disorder. Chapter 14, oh my goodness, I'm sure this is probably your least favorite chapter. It's all calculations, unless you love math, which I don't. <laughs> but need to know those calculations. There's just, it's memorizing. I, I hate to say that, but it really is. You have to memorize those formulas. We've already lectured through this. You guys have had a worksheet on it to do. You've also had those lab review questions if you did those, which you should. All, there was a ton of practice questions in those lab review questions that you do to help you kind of get familiarized with these formulas. Otherwise, it's just make flashcards, do what you can to memorize them. So these are the calculations I am asking you to know for the exam. Now, looking at the RPI one, oops, I clicked that, sorry. Looking at the RPI, that one is tricky because it needed that whole correction factor chart. And I had told you in the lecture, I'm never going to make you memorize that chart because you got too much to memorize as it is. I am going to send that chart to every single one of your lab instructors and program coordinators on your campus. So they will give it to whoever proctors your exam because I don't know who all proctors you guys. But make sure that you ask for the RPI chart when you go in to take your exam. They need to give that to you. Um, so I will give those instructions to each of your site contacts at the campus so that they can pass it along to whoever is going to proctor your exam so you have that. So make sure you ask for that. All right. And then with that being said, at the very bottom, remember on those calculations for MCV and MCHC, there are terms that go with that. And you guys have now kind of started playing with those terms a little bit on that worksheet. So when you get the MCV and the MCHC results, you need to apply a term to it. So that means knowing the reference range. Again, MCV is 80 to 100 femtoliters. So anything less than 80 is microcytic. Anything greater than 100 is macrocytic. MCHC reference range is 32 to 36 grams per deciliter. So anything less than 32 is hypochromic. Anything greater than 36 is hyperchromic. So again, that was all identified back in the Chapter 14 lecture PowerPoint. There was a chart in there or something like that. So kind of go back and relook at that as well. And then chapter 16, I think my original PowerPoints were named chapter 15, but it's supposed to be chapter 16 in your new edition of the textbook. Keep remembering how to do a platelet estimate. I know some of you guys have already started doing this in lab, so I think you kind of practice this, where you count platelets in 10 different fields, average that number, and multiply by 20,000. So hopefully that's a little simpler. Again, that reference range for platelets is 150 to 400. And then what we also learned in Chapter 16 was some other formulas in the form of performing in absolute counts. But in general, you should know the difference still of between a relative to an absolute. So again, a relative is the percent number. It's an estimation. An absolute is the actual number of cells. So to calculate, you just take the white count times that percentage put back in decimal form to get your absolute count. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to also know your reference ranges for your white cells. So you need to know your absolute and relative reference ranges for neutrophils, your absolute and relative reference ranges for lymphocytes, monos, eos, basos. So those five white blood cells, you need to know both absolute and relative so that when you come to the test and you have to calculate this answer, it's then going to ask you, is this kind of high or is this low? Is it a neutrophilia or a neutropenia? Is it a lymphocytopenia or lymphocytosis? So it's going to ask you to interpret that number. So not only calculate it, but also interpret it. So be able to do that. All right, so that's kind of a broad overview for the exam. Lots of information. It's only based on two weeks' worth of material, but it's a lot of information. Again, go back to the lecture PowerPoints, do those lab review questions, look at them again. Um, and just start memorizing as much as you can on the formulas and the reference ranges. I think if you understand the overall topics, the content, that should help. It's just the memorization that might be tricky for you. And just kind of one little tip, and you might already know this tip, but whenever I went to take an exam and it had calculations on it or it had something that I thought I was going to forget, the minute that they logged me into the exam, you always are allowed a blank sheet of paper. I wrote, as soon as they logged me in, 
and put my password in, I sat and first thing I did was wrote out all those calculations on the piece of paper because I didn't want to start taking the exam and then get confused halfway through it. So I wrote anything out on that paper that I thought I might forget. So that way when I got into the questions, it was already kind of written down. I didn't have to worry about keeping it memorized. So that might be something you can do is write out your calculations, write out your reference ranges after they put your password in, get that all out of your head, and then go and start doing the questions itself. All right, so I wish you guys the best of luck. Let me know if you have any questions, as always, um, and thanks so much. Have a good week.